On April 3rd of this year, 2016, news agencies all over the world carried stories that were based on what is now known as the Panama Papers. What the Panama Papers are is there 11 and a half million financial and tax documents and legal documents that were leaked from a law firm called Mossack Fonseca in Panama. Now the reason these were such a, a huge deal is because in these legal documents and papers a number of world leaders were identified and what they were involved in was tax evasion, corruption, wrongdoing, a number of things uh, that were problematic. A number of world leaders have resigned as a result of this. I'm sure the fallout will continue. Now one of the reasons why this, I think, angered people so much is some of these world leaders were the ones who had been preaching about the importance of paying taxes, about contributing uh, to government work while they themselves were working behind the scenes to avoid paying the very taxes that they were encouraging others to pay. The reason why it was so bothersome is many of these world leaders had been publicly denouncing corruption while secretly they had been involved either implicitly or by association with a lot of corruption and wrongdoing in the world. There's a term for that. It's called hypocrisy. And it drives people crazy. That's where a good portion of the anger about towards these world leaders came from, is from the hypocrisy. Now, hypocrisy is everywhere in our world. We see it all of the time. We live, for example, in a secular society that preaches the importance of tolerance, but which can be remarkably intolerant toward Christians. We are involved in a world in which certain educators come down hard upon their students for plagiarism, all the while taking credit for research that their research assistants did. We live in a world in which politicians who promote and preach family values are themselves secretly involved in adulterous affairs or soliciting prostitution. We live in a world in which healthcare professionals who speak about the importance of diet and exercise are themselves not paying much attention to their diet and exercise. We live in a world in which even moms, yes moms, I know it's Mother's Day, even moms can be guilty of hypocrisy, telling their children that they need to get along with one another, with their siblings, while not working themselves to have a good relationship with their siblings, telling their children not to worry about body image and what the world says about how you look, all the while being secretly concerned about their own appearance. Hypocrisy is everywhere. But of course, it's nowhere more present than it is in the church. No one is more guilty of hypocrisy than the Christian church. We tell others to pray and don't pray ourselves. We preach to others about sacrificial giving and don't give sacrificially ourselves. We talk about the importance of transparency and of honesty, all the while being deceptive ourselves. We condemn publicly adultery while secretly overlooking adultery of the heart. Hypocrisy is probably the number one reason why people choose not to become Christians the hypocrisy of the Christian church. 
And it's probably the number one reason why those who are Christians stop going to church and have nothing to do with the church anymore. No one is more guilty of hypocrisy than the Christian church. The question is, though, why is this the case? Why is hypocrisy so rampant? Why is it something that every single person struggles with? Why are we all guilty of sometimes saying one thing and doing another? Well, I'd like you to take a Bible and turn to the book of Romans chapter 2. Book of Romans chapter 2. If you're using one of the Bibles you picked up on the way in, it's page 912. Romans chapter 2. Now in the book of Romans, we have been talking about the fact that Jesus is risen from the dead, and because Jesus is risen from the dead, that changes everything. And so the book of Romans, the apostle Paul is taking the truth that Jesus is risen from the dead, and he is systematically explaining to us truth from God about all sorts of different subjects so that we might now understand what God has to say by faith. And this morning we get to look at the issue of hypocrisy. So Romans chapter 2, I'll begin reading in verse 17. Now you... If you call yourself a Jew, if you rely on the law and boast in God, if you know his will and approve of what is superior because you are instructed by the law, if you are convinced that you are a guide for the blind, a light for those who are in the dark, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of little children, because you have in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth, You then who teach others, do you not teach yourselves? You who preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that people should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, do you dishonor God by breaking the law? As it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. Okay, stop here for a moment. In just a minute, we're going to look at the solution to the issue of hypocrisy. But right here in these verses, there are a few observations I want to make to begin our time discussing this topic. The first is, is that this passage that we read is indeed about hypocrisy. It's about saying one thing and doing something else. It's about those who are preaching against stealing, turning around and doing the same thing, stealing themselves. Now it's important to understand that while hypocrisy can be doing the exact thing that you've preached against, Hypocrisy can also be doing something different but similar. Do you see in verse 22, the second half of the verse? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? A modern paraphrase of that might be. You who denounce corporate greed and fraud, do you fudge your expense statements? The idea is is that telling, not telling quite the truth on your expense statements is not the same as fraudulently misleading investors, but it's similar. It's both worshiping the God of money, and therefore hypocrisy is not just doing the exact thing that you've denounced. It's also being involved in something that may be different but similar. Second observation is you may have noticed that Paul is mentioning Jews here. It's important to realize that that's what he's talking about, but this issue of hypocrisy is applicable to all of us. 
and that what God is saying, he is saying to you and I today about the dangers of hypocrisy as well as the solution that he has for us. It's also important to note that most people would probably not choose to speak on hypocrisy on Mother's Day. That fact is not lost on me. When I looked at how the sermon schedule laid out, I thought, oh Lord have mercy. (laughs) Who comes on Mother's Day to hear a sermon about hypocrisy? Well, apparently this is what God wanted us to talk about. I'm encouraged, look in verse 22. You see the phrase, a teacher of little children? Moms and grandmothers are often those who are involved in the teaching of little children, and it's important to realize that moms and grandmothers are just as likely to engage in hypocrisy, and probably nothing is more damaging for a child or a grandchild than for a mother or grandmother to engage in hypocrisy. So God has chosen this for our subject today. Now, I still feel the pressure. I I wrote the first pass of this sermon on Mother's Day about hypocrisy, and I gave it to Tom, and he said, it sounds like you're apologizing and pandering to mothers for what this topic is about. He was right. So I rewrote it, and this is when I'm praying and feel like God wants us to share, because on this day, hypocrisy is something that all of us, can be guilty of. Fourth observation is the last verse. It says, as it is written, God's name is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. This is what I mean when I say hypocrisy is probably the number one reason why people who aren't Christians refuse to become Christians. The Bible says the exact same thing. The report of those who believe in God not doing the things they say that they believe causes God's name to be blasphemed among those who don't know him yet. Now when we think about the issue of hypocrisy, the good news is is that God's word does not simply diagnose the problem but it gives us a solution. We're going to look at that in just a moment. But in order to truly understand the solution to hypocrisy, we have to really wrap our minds around the issue. We have to really understand what is hypocrisy and why it happens. Now to do that, I would like to ask you a question that I asked myself this week that I really sort of struggled with as I tried to come to grips with what's going on in the passage. And the question that really got me thinking as I read this passage was, why would someone who is committing adultery preach against adultery? I mean, why not just keep your mouth shut? I mean, if you're engaged in adultery, that's bad enough. Why would you compound the problem by telling others they shouldn't be engaged in adultery? That was the question as I read this passage. Why would people go about doing this? Now, as I struggled with that question, I was led to a very strange but important story in the book of Genesis chapter 38. Now I'm going to tell you about that story in just a second, but let me tell you how I got there. It says in verse 17, Paul is addressing or talking about Jewish people. Now we're so familiar with the word Jew that we don't remember or don't think about or don't know that that's actually a shortened form of a different word. The word Jew comes from a man's name who was called Judah. Judah, whose name means praise in Hebrew, was one of Jacob's sons. As a result, a tribe was named after him, the tribe of Judah. 
throughout history, that tribe becomes the most dominant tribe in Israel so that a shortened form for that tribe, Jew, referring to the people of Judah, became a name for the descendants of Jacob. That's where we get the term Jew from. It comes from the tribe of Judah. Now, Judah himself, the person that gives rise to the tribe, is featured in only one story in the Bible. He's the main character of this rather strange and a little disturbing story in Genesis 38. Judah, we are told, has three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. The first son, Ur, marries a woman named Tamar. However, the Bible tells us that Ur was a wicked man, and so he died, leaving Tamar without any children. She was a childless widow. In Israelite society at that time, to be a childless widow was a death sentence. There was no one to be able to provide for her. So in society at the time, there were rules, and the rules were Judah had to give to Tamar his second son so that she might be able to have a family through him. So Judah does that. He gives Onan, who is his second child, to Tamar to be her husband. Onan, however, refuses to allow Tamar to have a family through him, and so he too is put to death for his wickedness. Judah has a third son, Shelah, but by this point Judah says, this isn't going very well. I've lost two boys already, and so he refuses to give his third son to Tamar. So she still remains a childless widow. She's in a desperate situation, and she takes matters into her own hands. And when I say that, I'm not saying that God approves of what she did. I'm saying she took matters into her own hands. She disguises herself as a prostitute, and Judah ends up sleeping with her without knowing that it's her. We pick up the story in Genesis 38, verse 24. About three months later, Judah was told, your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant. Now watch very closely Judah's response. Judah said, bring her out and have her burned to death. As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law, to Judah. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, see if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. They're Judas. Judah recognized them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son Shelah, and he did not sleep with her again. Now here's the very issue that Paul is talking about. Someone who is in the middle of committing adultery, someone who is in the middle of sexual immorality, denouncing another person who's done the same thing. Tamar is brought out, and when Judah hears that she has had sex outside of marriage, what's his response? Burn her! How dare she? How could she? Talk about the hypocrisy. He's the one who caused this. He's the one who's engaged in sexual immorality outside of marriage, just like she is. Now, why does he condemn her all the while doing the exact same thing himself? Well, in Jewish society at the time, it was somewhat acceptable for a man to sleep with a prostitute. 
it was not acceptable for a woman to get pregnant out of wedlock. Now listen, not in God's eyes. In God's eyes, what Judah did was at least as bad as what Tamar did, probably worse. But in society's eyes, what she did was worse. And that's the clue as to why Judah denounces something that he himself is guilty of. It's because he's not worried about what God thinks. God would have condemned his sin just as much, if not more, than Tamar's, but Judah isn't concerned about what God thinks. He's worried about what society around him thinks. This is his daughter-in-law. She's been found pregnant. That's going to bring guilt and shame on him. He wants her burned alive. And that's the clue to the source or one of the main sources of hypocrisy. People pleasing. Judah is willing to denounce his daughter-in-law, wanting her killed because he's worried about what people around him think. He's not worried about what God himself thinks of what Judah's done. If he did, Judah would have repented right there. I've done the same thing that she has. See, the reason why the politicians who are involved in the Panama Papers are out preaching that tax evasion is bad is not because they believe it themselves. If they thought it was important to pay taxes, they would be paying taxes. They're preaching that tax evasion is bad because that's what they think people want to hear. That's what they think the people who have put them in power want to hear. They want their politicians to stand up and to denounce tax evasion. So that's what they do, all the while evading the same taxes they're telling other people to pay. People-pleasing. The reason why pastors preach on prayer and tell people they need to pray even when they themselves are not praying is because they think that's what people want to hear from them. This is the requirement. I'm a pastor. i got to tell people to pray. It's being more worried about what people think and not being worried about what God thinks. Which brings us back to the book of Romans, chapter 2. Look in verse 28. A person is not a Jew who is one only outwardly, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit not by the written code, and then look at this phrase. Such a person's praise is not from other people, but from God. That's the exact issue that we're talking about. One of the main sources of hypocrisy is people-pleasing. People who want praise from others, praise from society, approval and acceptance from others, and aren't interested in receiving praise from God. The mother who wants to appear as a good mother to the people in her social circles is going to command an order that her children have their electronic use in line even while she herself may not. She's worried about other people. Are they going to think she's a good mom if their kids are constantly on electronics, all the while secretly slipping off and using her devices herself without any control? The grandmother who is worried about what others at church are going to think of her is going to prod and encourage her grandchildren to go on missions trips because that's going to be acceptable to be able to stand up and say, my grandchildren are going off on missions trips with the church. All the while, she herself is unwilling to go. 
That's the problem. People pleasing, being worried about what others think about you is going to lead to hypocrisy, saying one thing for their approval and doing something else in secret. You see, we often say out loud what we think people want to hear, but our actions show what we truly believe in our heart. So what then is the solution? Verse 29. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly. So we're speaking of Christians here. And circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. The good news is, because Jesus is raised from the dead, he is Lord over all things. We don't have to worry about pleasing other people. We only have to worry about pleasing him. And God has given us his spirit to be with us at all times, to give us a new heart so that we don't have to just say one thing and do something else. We can have a new heart that God's spirit is transforming so that we can be a different person than we were before. And God's spirit guides us and God's spirit directs us and God's spirit gives us things to follow. And when we do those things, We receive praise from God. So be encouraged. You don't have to let your lives be driven by the opinions of those around you. You're never going to be able to please your parents or your friend group or your spouse or all of the people. Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do things that are kind and good, but what I'm saying is ultimately, if you are a believer in Jesus, it is Jesus that you belong to. It is his praise that you are looking forward to. That's what Tom was talking to us about last week. When you stand before Jesus, He's the one who's going to evaluate your life. And the good news is, even if you've got the most wonderful parents in the world, even if you've got the most wonderful siblings, the most wonderful church, the most wonderful pastor of all time, (laughs) our opinions, they change. Our opinions, tainted with sin. But your Father in heaven, he's the one you want praise from. He's the one you want to please. And as long as you're trying to win the approval of me or of the church or the elders or the leadership or your spouse or your friends or your people at school or the people at work or your boss or whoever, you will be in danger of hypocrisy because you're going to say what you think they want to hear all the while doing something else in your heart. But the good news is God says you're free from their opinions. You're free from having to please them. Take, for example, the mom who's supposed to get up and go to mops. And she knows that God wants her to do that uh, because there's been a friend that she's been praying for, and the friend has finally agreed that she'll go with this mom to Mops, this mother's group, uh, as long as the mom will go with her. Well, the problem is, is that morning, uh, her daughter, her little girl, gets up so early and uh, wakes the mom up and needs attention, and so the mom's had hardly any sleep that night. She gets all of her other little kids, everybody gets all dressed up before breakfast. Then at breakfast, each of the children and the mom get a new fashion accessory. The breakfast spread all over their clothes. Everything is a train wreck. Nothing is going well. Now this mom is faced with a choice. She can still go to mops, not care that the ladies around her might think that she's a failure, (laughs) might care that everything has fallen apart, acknowledge that being a mom is incredibly difficult, it's incredibly tiring, that some mornings, no matter if you've done the very best you could possibly do, you still can't possibly pull it off. She simply show up and be honest in who she is and say, I'm here not because I've done a great job this morning. I'm here simply out of obedience to Jesus. Or she can stay home, make up some excuse as to why she can't go, 
She may even take that beautiful little girl, get her all cleaned up, get her washed up, put in her a nice new beautiful outfit, take a picture of it, post it on social media, and try to present it as everything at home is perfect. The good news is, it doesn't matter what the people on social media think about her. It doesn't matter what the people, it doesn't even matter what the women, other women at Mops think about her. God is looking at that woman who decides, yes, everything about my life feels like a train wreck right now. I got food in my hair, but I'm going to be obedient. And the good news is, is that that woman receives praise from God. There's no hypocrisy in her life. And God is pleased with her. Or to expand the examples, outside of mothers, take the man who at the workplace has a boss, and the boss places a high stock on spending time uh, at the barn in social situations where there's lots of drinking and inappropriate conversation. Uh, And the man feels like, look, if I don't participate in those kinds of things, if I'm not networking and building relationships and I'm not going to get the promotion, I'm not going to get the raise, I'm not going to get the great assignment. The problem is he's also a small group leader at church. And he's just been teaching a small group that we need to make sure that every word that proceeds out of our mouth is glorifying to God and not a stumbling block to others. And so that man is faced with a choice. If he's worried about what his boss thinks and about what his coworkers think, he is going to go to those places and participate in conversation and laugh at jokes he shouldn't be laughing at, saying one thing when he's with his small group and doing another when he's in the workplace. Or he can remember God's in control of all of this. He decides if I get a promotion. He decides what assignments I get. He's the one who decides what my salary is. I don't have to try to please my boss. I don't try to have to curry his favor. I don't have to get the rest of my coworkers to like me or to think that I'm just one of the guys because I do all the same things that they do. That man is free to do what the Spirit leads him to do. And when the Spirit leads him to say, You don't have to try to win their favor. You don't have to try to kiss up to them. You don't have to try to abandon the things you know you shouldn't be doing just to try to make something happen on your own. God's in control. And the good news is that God has given to that man his spirit. The spirit that can empower him. The spirit that is pleased with him. The spirit that will guide him. The spirit that is convicting him even now in his heart saying, You don't need to do this. You don't need to be that kind of person. I'm giving you a new heart. Be this new person that I'm making you. You see, the aha moment for me, the eye-opening thing as I wrestled through this passage, hypocrisy which is so prevalent, so common, of which we are all guilty of to some extent, has as one of its main sources people-pleasing. That as we seek praise from others, approval from others, we will engage in saying one thing and doing something else. But by the grace of God, he's given us his spirit and told us, don't worry about what they think of you. Worry about what I think of you. The same God who says to the moms today, you may think of yourself as a failure as a mom. You may think you've done a terrible job. You may think as a looking at your children, maybe they've walked away from the Lord. Maybe you've got little children and they're they're disobedient, they're difficult, whatever it may be. Please listen to me. It's not what society thinks. It's not what the people around you think. It's not even what you think. Your praise comes from God. And the fact that you're being obedient the fact that you are trying, the fact that you are loving these people the best that you can, God is pleased with that. For the rest of us here, whatever situation they're in, at work, at home, in church, wherever it may be, there are people's expectations of how we're supposed to behave, of what we're supposed to look like, of how things are supposed to go. But thanks be to God, It's only his opinion that matters. And our heavenly father 
is a kind, merciful, gracious, patient, long-suffering, the kind of God whose love is so great for us that he is slow to get angry, and he overlooks all sorts of stuff because his love is so great for us. That God, through his Spirit, tells us that he's pleased with us.